Good morning, friends. Glad to see you here. Anxious to worship together and and uh, dive into God's word and and see what the Holy Spirit may have for us this morning. We're getting close to Independence Day, as you know. Um, don't know if that's a big thing to you, but it's a big thing to our country. Uh, July 4th uh, is an important date for every American uh, because it represents our freedom, right? It represents something that's very important to us. Uh, it's, it's in our DNA, isn't it, as Americans? Uh, we, we yearn for freedom. Starting at a very young age, we, we uh, want to be free, right? We want to be free from our parents. I don't know how old you were when you stopped holding your mom's hand or your dad's hand, but uh, I remember when we were raising our children that, you know, all of a sudden my boy didn't want to hold my hand anymore. And I was happy about that because he was 25. Um, so it's like <laughs> but uh, no, it, uh, our kids used to enjoy holding our hands until they didn't, right? And being with us until they didn't. We want to be free from the demands of our school teachers, right, and our employers. We, we are excited about summer vacation when we are in school, or we're excited about a vacation when we're employed and look forward to that time away from work because we're free then. And now, at this time of year, we have graduations, and, and what are we celebrating? Well, besides accomplishment, we celebrate freedom, right? They, they, these high schoolers walk across the stage and they, or the college people walk across the stage and they hold up their diploma and, and yell with Mel Gibson, freedom, you know? <laughs> Finally, free. The Apostle Paul knew about the joys of freedom as well. He, he knew it instinctively, but he also learned it in a very practical way because, as you know, he spent a lot of time in prison, didn't he? Uh, the prison epistles are called prison epistles because they were all written from prison. He was familiar with chains and shackles and restrictions. In fact, he probably had chains on his wrist and ankles or both when he wrote the letter to the Colossians. Jesus also, being human, had an instinctive interest and value in freedom. He knew it was important to humanity, which is why he was able to get the attention of his audience when he said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They all wanted that. They wanted freedom. We want freedom. And we, and we despise restriction. The, the Colossian church had been infiltrated by false teachers who were throwing the church into chaos by their teaching. They were pressuring the church to do certain things in certain ways, and if you didn't do them in those ways, they were alienated. But they were wanting, these false teachers were wanting the Colossian church to ascribe to their expectations, their preferred standards. They were teaching that in order to be the kind of Christian that had pious reputations or religious superiority or adhered to rigorous regu regulations, they needed to agree and follow the teaching of these false teachers. Do it my way or else was the teaching. These teachers were attempting to set themselves as the standards by using the vulnerability that came from Jewish Christians and converting from Judaism to Christianity. That was, a, that was a difficult road for these folks. Epaphras, if you remember, was the pastor of the, the Colossian church, um, and he was at his wit's end trying to guide this young church through this dangerous quagmire. Uh, because of his great love for and concern for the church that he was pastoring and not really knowing how to deal with the false teachers and what they were teaching, he left Colossae and traveled to Rome to visit Paul who was in prison to ask the apostle who had led Epaphras to Christ how to deal with these false teachers in his home church 
And the book of Colossians that we hold in our hands is the result of that visit. This is Paul's answer to the false teachers that were causing such chaos in the Colossian church. In this short letter, Paul was reminding the Colossians that they didn't need any of what those false teachers were promoting. In fact, it was unnecessary and dangerous baggage for the Christian to carry around. The Colossians already possessed the only thing they needed, which was Christ, which is why the person and work of Christ keeps coming up in the book of Colossians. When anything is added to Christ, the Christian life becomes untenable, burdensome, and joyless. One of the great benefits of being in Christ is freedom. Remember what Paul wrote. If you look at your Bibles, if you don't have them open yet to Colossians, open them with me right now to Colossians chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 6 particularly and the comments that follow on the heels of verse 6. Notice what he says. He says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then he continues all the way through our text today to encourage, exhort these readers, these young, vulnerable Christians to pursue Christ and nothing else. So what it means to continue to walk in him, established in the faith, means to live your Christian life in view of all that Christ has accomplished for you. Don't, don't be burdened by people who, who just stack expectation upon expectation on your shoulders. That's the only path to joyful Christian living. So the text that we're looking at today begins in verse 16 through verse 23, and it confirms three essential areas in which freedom is very important to us Christians. Three essential areas in which freedom is very important to us Christians who desire a joyful Christian life, not a burdensome one. So let's look at these one at a time. The first is this, that the gospel sets us free from reputation pressure. The gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free from reputation pressure. Now trying to maintain a certain reputation can be exhausting. Uh, if you remember your time as a teenager, you can probably relate to this. Making sure that you had the right clothes, the right car, the right friends, the right neighborhood, and listening to the right music wore us out, didn't it? Reputation pressure doesn't ease much when you enter your 20s, 30s, or 40s. Seems to continue. Some people never escape the pressure of having to maintain a certain reputation and live up to the expectations of people that they kind of fear. It, it brings bondage and burden and pressure, that kind of living. In verse 16 and 18, though, Paul is pulling the rug out from underneath this kind of pressure, the kind that comes from trying to maintain a reputation, particularly in the Christian life. It, it isn't just in the secular arena that the pressure of reputation exists. No, it, it happens here in churches. So Paul not only understood the impact of physical change, that is, shackles, but he also understood the impact of spiritual change and in the Christian life and, and the shackling that takes place when you are burdened with chains. This is why he's writing so emphatically, so powerfully, strongly in this section of the letter. He knew that spiritual shackles kills joy. Now let's look at the source of this pressure, this reputation pressure. Where did it come from? Well, the false teachers that Paul and Epaphras were trying to checkmate um, were boasting about their adherence to religious dietary laws and following requirements of religious festivals. 
and then adding aberrant practices, including the worship of angels and uh, personal visions. Look, look at verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to festival and new moons. All right, now, and then verse 18. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism, the worship of angels, going on de in detail about visions puffed up by his sensuous mind. So these false teachers were, were trying to intimidate the Colossian believers into submitting to their pressure their persuasions, their expectations. This is what good Jewish Christians do, people. Just believe what I say and do what I say, is what they were probably hearing. They were trying to make this young group of Colossian Christians believe that their religious reputation was in jeopardy unless they followed the details of this teaching. In verse 18, Paul wrote that these false teachers were proud and unspiritual. Not, not ones to be followed, but ones to be shunned. Their, their whole process was motivated by self-righteous pride. They wanted a group of people following them around, acting like they wanted them to act. To give you some practical connection to what the Colossians were feeling, we also may feel some pressure to maintain a certain religious persona or reputation. Have you ever felt that? Um, either in this church or other churches? If you were raised in a legalistic environment, you understand this fully. A good Christian wouldn't do that, would they? Why are you eating that or drinking that? Don't you think that kind of shames Christ? Have you heard those kind of things? Uh, this can be seen in many areas of the Christian life. Paul lists some of these areas in verse 16. Look again. Things that we might struggle with. People passing judgment on us concerning what we eat or what we drink. You ever been there? Or continue regarding a festival or whether or not you attend church on a certain day or not. So we have, we have pressure being applied to us by people with their own standards and expectations in view. So this is what Paul is addressing in his day and the Holy Spirit addressing in our day, our experience. So what is the means of freedom? How do we get from, out from under that kind of thing? Well, the text tells us. Paul said, don't allow those teachers to judge you or disqualify you. Obviously, the Colossians couldn't control the behavior of the false teachers, right? But they could control how they responded to them. You can't, you can't control what people think about your decisions or choices. Um, but you can control how you respond to them, right? It's, this is what Paul is after here. We have people around us that may try to steal our joyful freedoms by pressuring us to act in certain ways to fit into their expectations, to maintain some kind of reputation here. You know, this is going to look bad on our church if you drink that, especially in public, or do that. Um, and unfortunately, this kind of pressure usually comes from people that we respect, at least the ones we want approval of. So, to getting back to the solution to this pressure or the means of freedom, why are you free from the pressure of reputation, Christian? Well, you're free from the pressure of reputation because of your reputation with God. It is secure if you're in Christ. It is not dependent on what you eat or drink or whether or not you show up on certain days. This is what Paul is saying. There is only one reputation that matters, and it is your reputation with God. God. 
We've been freed from any and all oppressive human demands. We are free to live in the joy-filled reality of being accepted by God himself. So your pious performance has no influence on what truly matters. What you decide to eat or drink doesn't really impress God. Whether or not you think one Christian holiday is more important than another is not the thing that the Trinity is discussing. Now, does this mean that piety is wrong for us? Of course not. We're called to be holy, right? No. The, believing, what, what the problem is with piety is that being pious somehow impresses God. That it establishes your relationship and reputation with God. That is not the point of piety, or Christian holiday for that matter. So, Paul is saying, don't listen to anyone who may pass judgment on your diet, saying that good Christians wouldn't do that. Their opinion doesn't matter. My mom always used to say, well, just smile and go do what you want to do. No, well, just say thank you, John, and, and then go do what you want to do. So don't listen to people who might suggest to you that you need to be observing or not observing certain holidays. Um, don't worry about what they think you ought or ought not to be drinking or eating. We aren't under any obligation other than making much of Christ. That's our obligation, is making much of Christ. Our takeaway from these verses is that our identity must be found in Christ, not on the opinions and approval of others. Um, verse 20 is Paul's answer to each of the issues that, we're gonna, uh, uh, that he's addressing and that we're going to address this morning. Look at verse 20. He says, If you have died with Christ to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Paul is scratching his head and saying, what are you thinking? Why are you acting as if they have some pressure and authority over you? They don't. You, are, you have died with Christ. You're in him. Your spiritual life, your joy is not dependent on what they think about you. Don't let them control you. We no longer care about man's approval. We're slaves to Christ, not the expectations of others. Reputations are confined to other people's perceptions, facades, personas. But we, Sun Valley Church, we are concerned with Christ. This becomes very practical within the relationships we have at church, of course. If we're trying to maintain the reputation of a squeaky clean little Christian, putting forward a facade of perfection, then we will grow weary in keeping up pretenses and our joy will be greatly diminished. One of the things that we desire for you is transparency. One of the reasons that we publicly confess our sins is for this very reason. We are accountable to Christ alone. So, we want to avoid superficiality. We want to stop pretending that everything is hunky-dory in the Christian life when in fact we all know if you're like me, we have struggles, failures, things that we're not good at. But all these things, if they are sin, have been forgiven. Our reputation before God is in Christ not in what you think of me or what you think of each other. So we don't need to cover up our past or pretend we don't have struggles with anything in the present. Being gospel-centered and grace-driven actually helps us think correctly about who we are and how we relate to one another. We acknowledge our sin. We, we, we are transparent about our struggles. And when that starts happening as a practice, you would be surprised at how much joy fills the room and how much growth takes place in the lives of those people in the room. Um, 
Next thing that Paul addresses is freedom. The gospel frees us from religious pressure, not just reputational pressure, but religious pressure. And all these things are related. You'll see the overlap as we work our way through them. But here particularly, we're looking at religious pressure. The reason Paul is so intent here on clearly communicating these things is that freedom brings joy while oppression brings the opposite, joylessness. Paul, as an apostle, knew that God is interested in our joy. Did you know that? That God is actually interested in your joy? You remember the meditation verse at the first of the service? Rejoice in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Do you think that that verse was inspired? And if it was, by whom? <laughs> by God. God cares about your joy. He is, he is opposed to joyless oppression. So, where does this type of pressure, religious pressure, come from? And as I said, it's similar to reputational pressure, but a bit different. What was the primary thing that historically produced heavy burdens on God's people? What was it? What was that thing that caused Jewish life to feel oppressive? Didn't Jesus say it was the law? And he added to that, poor teachers or poor leaders teaching the law? Yeah, that's what it was. The Jews were carrying a heavy burden of religious bondage. In chapter 2, verse 8, if you look down at that, you'll see that Paul warns the Colossians not to be taken captive. Don't be taken captive by false teaching. And, of course, being captive assumes joylessness. If you have a joyless religion, you have a false religion. People, if you are a Christian and are joyless, you've got Christianity wrong. The false teachers in Colossae were teaching that in order to be right with God, there were certain hoops that you needed to jump through, religious hoops. You needed to earn God's favor through your religious performance. It's easy to see that this was, of course, motivated by pride from these false teachers. Judaism, as you know, was primarily a works-based religion, but ultimately, those Old Testament Jews were saved the same way we were, by faith. They were looking forward to the work of the Messiah. We look back to the work of the Messiah, both by faith. So, as we think about the religious pressure that Paul's addressing here, we have to, we have to understand that they did have rules and regulations as Jews that were required of them to follow. But they were all, all of these regulations were completely fulfilled in Christ, which is why Paul said to the Romans that Christ is an end to the law. He has fulfilled all of it for you, for me, for every Jew. So this is, this is the value of the law. It pushed them towards Christ. They saw the truths within the law, the principles within the law, but really didn't understand how to relate to God through them joyfully until Christ came. Food and drink, festival, new moon, or Sabbath were all references that Paul used to show the religious pressure that all these Jewish converts to Christianity had been feeling. And what the false teachers were trying to use to hold power and leverage over them to gain control. Let's look at the means of freedom from this kind of religious pressure. Ancient Jews and the Jewish Christians in Colossae needed to remember that all those religious regulations, what to say, were just shadows. That's interesting terminology, isn't it? Look at this. He says in verse 17, these, referring to religious pressure, were just shadows of the things that were to come. What's the end of the verse say? But the substance... The purpose was Christ. Now, look, look here 
at verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 10. I have it on the overhead for you. For since the law has, was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices, that's religious pressure, the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. The law was just a picture, a shadow of something. What might that something be? The work of Christ, the person and work of Christ. That's what the law was for. That's why Paul called the, the, the law a tutor, a babysitter until Christ came. The term shadow is an important biblical word. In your Bibles, you might want to circle that word. It carries a couple of important meanings. One meaning of shadow is temporary. Shadows are temporary, right? The sun comes up and shadows move across the ground. They, well, they're always moving. They're temporary. As it relates to Jewish law, it means that Judaism was temporary. It was preparatory. <laughs> they were just pictures of the good things that were to come. So how, what else do we call shadows? Pictures, types, that's what shadows are, biblically speaking. Um, this is exactly what Paul said in verse 17. Shadows, but the substance. Pictures, types, things to help you see what re the reality is, Christ. Um, you know, Many of us have pictures of loved ones um, at some point, someplace in our home or on our person. Uh, and it would, be, it would be ridiculous to think that you would be more enamored with the picture than the substance of the picture, right? You wouldn't, if you hadn't seen, for example, a loved one, uh, and you looked at their picture every day as you prayed for them or remembered good things about them or thought of them to ignore the person when they walked into the room for the first time and say just hold on a minute I'm, I'm just enjoying the picture of you no it's foolishness isn't it this was the problem with religious pressure this is the problem with religious pressure you're holding on to pictures and types and things that are supposed to point you to Christ. But guess who's in the room? Christ. The person. The substance of all those religious things that we put ourselves through. And the Jewish people put themselves through. The, the law revealed God's character, of course. When you read the Ten Commandments, you, you see the character of God coming through. Clearly, but when Jesus arrived, we had God, God's character in a person. Listen to Colossians 1.15. He, that is Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. You know, want to know what God thinks? Follow Jesus around. The first word in verse 16 is therefore. It's an important word, right? It's a transitionary word here also. It's used to help us remember what has just been said in the previous verses. I've said some important things, therefore, then proposition, all right? But it is, it is the basis for explaining the current conversation. In other words, our completeness in Christ, which started back in verse 9 all the way through 15, is what the word therefore is pointing to. Being complete in Christ. You remember we went through this here about a month ago and, and lasted about a month? Complete atonement in Christ. Complete justification in Christ. Complete sanctification in Christ. Complete perseverance and glorification in Christ. That's what verses 9 through 15 were of we're about. Therefore, let no one tell you how you ought to think or act. Why? Because you're complete in Christ. <laughs> it's the answer to reputation pressure. 
Being complete in Christ is the answer to religious pressure. And as we'll see, it's the answer to pressures from regulations. All the amazing truths that are wrapped up in our completeness in Christ, friends, is the bomb shelter of our Christian life. Nothing can penetrate that fortress. Why? Because you are complete in Christ. Nothing can penetrate that spiritual truth. Who Christ is and what he has accomplished answers every assault that we may face. We are free from any pressure to fit into someone else's expectations. Why? Because I'm complete in Christ. That's why. I'm, I'm free from the pressure to abide by certain religious practices and standards. Why? Because I'm complete in Christ. He's in the room. I don't have to abide by old pictures. Friends, we are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. It's kind of like the most important rule of, of real estate. Location, location, location. It, the most important truth of Christian life, we are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. In verse 18, Paul said, let no one disqualify you. Let no one judge you. Let no one disqualify you. The word disqualify has the idea of being disqualified from an athletic competition. Like, okay, you fouled out. That's your fifth one. You're out. This is your second yellow card. Now here's a red card. You're out. That's the disqualification that's in view here. Um, And there's two ways that we need to think about this disqualification. How can, how can you, Christian, be disqualified, what Paul says here in verse 18, how can you be disqualified if you're in Christ? Well, there's the point, but let me, let me unpack this for you. If you do succumb to the human demands of legalists or hedonists or monastics or even contemplative spirituality, then you are disqualifying yourself from the grace of God. If if you want to go down the road of works, then you're not going down the road of grace. You've disqualified yourself. Why? Because God only operates on the basis of grace. This leads to the second way of thinking about disqualification. The demanding, coercing, intimidating demands of false teachers are unable to disqualify you. If you're in Christ, why is this so? Why, why does, do their expectations, why are they unable to disqualify you, disqualify you? Because only God can judge and only God can disqualify. Th- those who pressure others to submit to their preferences Paul is saying are self-centered and self-righteous individual, uh, individuals who are marked by superficial spirituality. It's not real spirituality, it's superficial, it's false. Paul noted their severe treatment of the bodies. Did you see this down at the end of the chapter? They, they had severe treatment of their bodies. They, who knows what they did? They, they walked on glass, slept on nails, whipped themselves, who knows? Asceticism was another mark. Indulgence. It didn't work, right? It, it, what does it say? They're of no value in stopping indulgence of the flesh. It didn't work. Those who pressure us to follow their expectations are really not sub- submitting to Christ. They're, they're exalting self. Look, look what it says here. In verse 19, they're not holding fast to the head. And who is the head? Christ. Anybody who tries to put reputational, religious, and we'll see here in a minute, the third one, regulation, pressure on you, in fact, isn't spiritual. They're not following the head. They're promoting self. So in order to avoid captivity by burdensome religious expectation, Paul exhorts the 
the embrace of freedom in Christ. He said in verse 16, let no one pass judgment on you. In verse 18, let no one disqualify you. In verse 20, he said, why do you submit to these regulations? The answer, friends, you're in Christ. You don't need to succumb to any of that. You died to all that stuff. Each of these admonitions depends on this important conditional clause in verse 20. You got a pen? Underline this in your Bible. If with Christ you died, if in fact you are in Christ, you died to all these things, they have no control over you. Why? Because you're dead to them. You're dead to reputational pressure, religious pressure. It has no power over you. This is the center of this passage. It's the lens through which Paul wants us to look at all these things that pressure us. I've died to those things. I've died to those things. I've died to those things. He explains in the text how the finished work of Christ and our participation in his death frees us from all these obligations, from human pressure, from false religious expectations, from regulations that people might say you need to follow. Let's, let's go to our final point. Free from regulation pressure. The fact that we've died with Christ, the fact that we've embraced his gospel, frees us from regulation pressure. Free people don't like regulations, do they? We're all pretty excited about the new regulation on gas stoves, right? Yeah, it's about time, is what we say. <laughs> of course not. We hate regulation. It, it's, it makes us mad. It costs us money. All this stuff, we don't like it. So what's the source of the regulation that Paul's talking about? Well, the point is really just an expansion of what Paul's already said about religious pressure and reputational pressure. This is something that, were, that was heavy burdens to the Jewish people for centuries. These, these regulations, one stacked upon another. You know there was over 690 regulations, human regulations added to the Ten Commandments? 690. You, you could only walk so many steps on the Sabbath because the law was keep the Sabbath holy. Here's how we're going to keep the Sabbath holy. You can only walk 30 steps. Uh, you, you can't pick up a rope that's longer than three feet. If, you pick, if it's three feet one inch, that's work. And these regulations went on and on and on. And so people were afraid to breathe on the Sabbath, which was supposed to be a day of rest. How are you going to rest with all those regulations hanging over your head? You don't. You're, you're, you're in fear of your, for your life with regulations. And, and this kind of pressure doesn't go away with Judaism. We experience similar type of things in our Christian life. People trying to regulate what you do or what you don't do. Things that you need to do and things that you must not do. Things that you must think about and not think about. We have a few regulations ourselves, don't we, as Christians? What's the means to freedom? How do we get out from underneath this burden? Well, the only one who can pass judgment on you, the only one who can disqualify you, is God, right? We've made that clear. Paul's made that clear. So listen to what Paul said about this in Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. It's a, it's a little longer, but it's such an important passage. And it answers the question about regulation. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? <clears throat> 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Not stack us with regulations, more regulations, but no, give us things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? False teachers? You know, legalists in the church? Article writers from Bob Jones University? Who's going who's gonna to do this? Who's going to condemn us? It's God who justifies. In other words, God's the judge, not these people. Who is to condemn? Your mom? Your pastor? I hope not. Friends, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Any of this stuff that we've been talking about today going to separate you from the love of Christ? No. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, regulation, reputation, religiosity, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day, all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Part of the means of freedom from regulation is understanding, friends, these very truths. God is the judge. <laughs> we don't judge each other. God is the judge. And as such, we need to keep an eye on his standards, <laughs> his expectations. For us. Part of the means of freedom from regulation is understanding actually how we grow in Christ. It's not by submitting to laws and regulations and burdens and all these things. No. How we grow spiritually, Paul lays out right here in front of us in verse 19. These people who were pressuring the Colossians those who might pressure us in our day, Paul says in verse 19, are not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together through the joints and ligaments grows with a growth that's from God. That's an interesting insert, isn't it, into this conversation. The things that we think will help us receive uh, affirmation, approval, is not what we can inflict on one another. It's actually only from God. So part of the means of freedom from regulation is understanding how we're going to grow. It's not by producing, it's not by um, pursuing other people's expectations. It's by depending on the Lord for spiritual growth. Uh, we don't grow on our own, of course. Um, we don't grow by submitting to the preferences and expectations of others. The way we grow, Sun Valley Church, is to be personally and corporately committed to Christ and all that he has done for us. Who, who nourishes us through his word, verse 19 says. We must first of all understand that we share in the death of Christ. Are, are you saved? Are you a believer? Have you embraced the gospel? Then, then part of your identity is that you have died with Christ. And dying with Christ means you've died to all these things that Paul is addressing. Regulation, reputation, religiosity. You've died to that stuff. So don't live like you're still submitting to it or need to submit to it. Friends, being in Christ means that his death was our death. Death to self. Death to self. 
death to external pressure. His burial was our burial of our old selfish ways and the burial of those things that try to control us. His resurrection was a resurrection to a new life in Christ. Not following, not submitting, not being pressured by, but following Christ alone. And God causes our spiritual growth and the spiritual depth through a personal and corporate commitment to God, to his word, and to his people. Why live as, this, as if you're still alive in this world, he asks. You, you realize you've died with Christ, right? And we're, we are not spiritually, at least, responsive to anything from the world because we've died to it. We, we've said this numerous times, but dead people don't respond to things. This is how we ought to respond to worldly pressures, even pressures within the church that aren't from God. I'm dead to that. Go, go talk to somebody else who's alive. I'm dead to that. Friends, we died to the world. We, we died to worldly pressure. We've died to all those things that people would try to use to undermine our joy. All the regulations like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch are human regulations, human pressures to conform. And we've been set free from that, Christian. We've been set free from bondage to joy. I hope your Christian life isn't about do's and don'ts. If it is, that's not a Christian life. (laughs) Do you understand that? Let's pray. Lord, because of our weakness, we we still seem to be influenced by our needs for approval, um, needs to impress. Holy Spirit, take that from us. I ask that, that this passage that we've just covered will sink deeply into our hearts and we will not be uh, thrown off track, will not be deceived into pursuing um, acceptance, approval from worldly things or worldly people. Help us to embrace Christ fully. Help us to live in the joy of acceptance by the only judge who exists And that is by God who loves us and gave his son for us. What a wonderful, joyful passage this is. Lord, uh, sink it deep into our souls and hearts. And I pray this in your name. Amen.